So, having said that, I think we just go straight on and, and do our best practices and troubleshooting. I put those two together because we found it a, a good opportunity to, to lump these two together. Um, I've been involved in, in writing best practice guides for Praise. Praise is an EU project which is ending. It's, it started in, in uh, more than 10 years ago and it's now ending, but it produced a lot of best practice guides. So um, there are best practice guides for different systems. There are best practice guides for processors. There are best practice guides for accelerators and for IO. So there's a lot of lessons to be learned by downloading and reading some of these best practice guides. There is even a best practice guide for nights landing, but uh, that was one of the, of the more special. So if you go into the search for praise and best practice guide, you'll find a whole list of them. So best practices is the first order approximation. I've tested it and it works. That might not be the absolute best practices, but then that gives us to the next order. How to improve efficiency, performance, experience, resource usage, and good behavior. And of course, helping people to get on board and training new people how to use the resources in a good way. So know your workload. A lot of people develop the program themselves. They know very well what's going on, or hopefully they do. Um, some people just download some random program from the internet and hope that it works. If they are lucky, the configure will run through and the make it will also run through. And they install it locally and, and run, hope and hoping for the best. But you can see on, on the on the drawing here that programming in parallel is not so easy. You have to get everybody to pull in the right direction. And you have things to help us to do that. There are different paradigms of, of doing so, but open MP for threading and MPI for for distributed. Um but understanding what you run on the system is important so that you are not abusing the system. Some of you who were doing exercises yesterday might notice that Saga was very slow. It took forever to do something. And that was because people were running jobs. They were not. It's hard to say whether, whether it could have been done in a different way or not. But if you are not alone, on the system that can happen that people run jobs that take up so much of the resources that everybody feels that it's impossible to work because it's so slow the, that was regarding the file system so try to 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 think about what you are running so that you are not abusing the resources so and destroy for everybody else and of course don't waste the resources that we learned yesterday that if you do scaling if you increase the number of CPU, your program might run slower. So if you do that, you are wasting CPUs and there is not an infinite amount of resources and there are other people waiting to be served in the queue. So try to run optimally. So what information do I need and how to get it? Is the application parallel? It might not be parallel. Two turtles don't go twice as fast, but they can pull twice as much. So are the executable independent, like typical for MPI? And then if you have massive amount of independent executable, you can still run in parallel because that's that's something that isn't convey and, and taught in, 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 in parallel programming that if you have an infinite or, an, or an, not an infinite, but a large number of tasks like Monte Carlo tasks, where you just draw something randomly and run the application to get one point. You can do that totally independent. And you can use something like, like array run or, or other ways of doing it. But each application is not parallel, but you have a farm of applications that you can run and you get something, you get the job done in run in parallel without programming in parallel. So there are some special cases like Monte Carlo is one of them where you can just run a thousand jobs with different input and map out thousand points in, in, in your coordinate system. So this is, this is the trivial stuff. Which brings us over to the next level up in, in complexity about 
parallel applications. Is it single core? Is it multi-core? Is it shared memory or distributed memory? Single core is, is easy. That's you're on only on one core, but that's not really supercomputing. But multi-core, okay, it's using more than one core. Uh, in other words, it's more than one thread, or a thread is a stream of instructions, like a sequential program. You can run several of these sequential programs, like like you say you are doing a loop. Loop is, is, is a stream of instruction inside the loop. You could then, if you have 10 iterations of the loop, you could run those 10 iterations parallel from one to 10 in 10 cores and run 10 times as fast. Or if you have, then you have shared memory. If you are running in parallel with distributed memory, you, each of those programs, or they are called ranks, if you're using MPI, are running on a different node. And there is no way of knowing what the others are doing unless you are sending messages. Hence, the MPI stands for Message Passing Interface. So memory footprint, how much memory do you need? That is quite important. So we cover this in, in different way. I will cover it. And later on today, there is an, there is also ways of, of understanding how to ask for memory. So knowing how much memory you use is important. Then there are cores or processors. There are many, many different names. Core is, is a CPU. A processor is a CPU. So, so it's, a, it's, it's a bit different what you actually refer to. But the scaling is important, and that we tried to convey yesterday how important it is. And there was even an exercise. Then it's the input and output, which is important. Because as we learned yesterday, the file system was sluggish. LS took several tens of seconds. So input and output is important. Can we isolate the input and output not to affect the others? Then, of course, is the runtime. If the runtimes are, I learned that this is not no longer the case, but it used to be when Moore's law was still applying 100%, that if your job took more than nine months to complete, it would be you got the answer faster by waiting because the next generation of processor will be so fast that you will get the answer faster. So it was better to wait for the next generation and run it then than to do it with current generation. So, but that's no longer the case, but it still applies to some extent because the modern processors have more cores and, and systems are generally bigger. But runtime there is also limit how long runtime you can have. So runtime is important. Single node application, they could be single or multi-core, but the point is that they are sharing the memory. Keywords to look out for if you are downloading some random application from the internet and want to run, and I really need this application, then you have to check, is it parallel? Is it serial or whatever? Serial means single core. Keywords to look out for is OpenMP, multi-core, shared memory, threaded, p-thread, POSIX thread or NCPU. And on the right hand, lower right hand side, there are some commands that you can try to run. There are some examples I, I, I put together that you could could try to, to the, you can try them later on because I'm not sure if they're copied and available at, at this time. But, but anyway, those you can try, but those are some commands that you can try to, to identify your application to see if it's what kind of if it fits in one of these like if grep or or strings or whatever will give out some some clues to what's happening so this you can check with your random application and see if if it matches this it at least multi -thread. mpi keyword to look out for is mpi distributed memory and there are a couple of of, of, of fancy commands that you can run like ldd ldd lists the libraries it use the dynamically loaded libraries and strings just print out strings within the executable. So strings is, is just looking for, for patterns in the characters that can be printed. So how do I set and request the cores and the runtime and so on? So 
you need normally to do this manually, trial and error by, by asking Slurm to help you. You can run this, this test job. This is a very simple thing, but you can see it, it will, this is the array run to, in, the, in case with no parallel execution, but you can run this hundred times over or even more. So you can see that you, you run the only a single task and you can see that Slurm will give you, give you some, some clues to what you will, a Slurm underscore array and give task ID count, maximum, minimum, and so on. And I put it just, I execute a very, very basic command. It's a DD that copies from the, the random device to, to a file, 128, and, and it's an array task ID uh, in the name. So you can now launch that one like a patch array one to zero to, to three array run. That one it's an it's a nice little thing to to play around with later on when you have when you have time or want to learn more about this. Interactively, of course, you a lot of people want to run jobs interactively, and this is okay for short jobs with a limited memory footprint. So I'm five to 15 minutes is okay. I saw people running for hundreds of minutes yesterday, which is not good. So running production on the front end nodes are not allowed, but some system might have either pre-proc nodes or interactive nodes or whatever, but it's also possible to reserve a node using Slurm and run interactively there and, and explore, explore the space. Um, that, brings us over to running the application. What's going on? There are two very, very nice tools that you can use. If you have a running job, a, a, a job running on several nodes, you are allowed to SSH into to these nodes. So you could SSH into one of the nodes that you have things running on, and you can run HTOP and see what's going on. And top will give you just text. HTOP will give you these bars that you can see on the screen. I will also give you some text below. Um, if you have 128 cores like on Tetsi, it will fill the screen. So you might have to enlarge your window quite a bit. But to learn more about top and HTOP, there is some probably, I think it will be covered in, in, in also later on today, but you can test them and play with them. There's a lot of options within those that you can, can, can play, but this is not a, an exercise or, or a lecture in, in, in these tools. So you have to review the man pages and, and do it yourself. This one is a bit hard. This slide covers and try to explain the difference of, of hyper-threading, virtual cores, or whatever you like to call it. Um, the box that you see are the a box model or a map of what how a modern processor core this this box is a single core on the cpu or on on the processor processor generally fair to the to the to the thing that fit in the socket and cores are referring to the individual cores of which they could be up to 64 in the processor betsy has 64 cores in each processor or socket. Um, each of these cores have something like this inside. You see there are two streams of instructions coming in because I have enabled the multi-threading or symmetrical multi-threading, SMT. Anyway, there are two streams of instructions entering. They first come into the instruction cache. In there is just, that's just a memory. So that's there is no concept of, of, of data streams in that memory, but the, the codes are, the, the instruction streams are put into that memory, copied from the main memory and put into the, to the 64 instruction cache. It, it's a four way thing, so it can actually do four, four streams from the memory. Then it goes to decoding it can decode four instructions per cycle. So it could, in principle, take four streams and decode the four streams. 
then it put it into the micro Q operations, micro operations Q. And that translates the x86 instruction into simple instruction that could be understood by the executional units that we have below. There is an integer machinery here, and there is a floating point machinery. So if those two instructions Jim, run two totally different programs, then the yellow stream will run on the integer unit. The blue one will run on the floating point unit. And since those two are totally independent, almost, you could expect to have twice the performance. Of course, you see they have to be decoded, but that's done in parallel. I also think that the data cache and, and the re, re, retirement uh, units are also double. So in principle, if you were able to schedule these instructions in a good way, you could expect almost twice the performance with two threads if you are running different things. But you learned yesterday, and I can repeat it now, an MPI program is a single program that we launch multiple copies of. And not only that, but they are also mm -hmm. synchronized with the with, um, um, collective, collective operations, like the barrier. So the barrier makes sure that they are all waiting at the same time and, and are synchronized. So that means that the two instruction stream that could come in, the yellow and the blue one could come in with two MPI ranks coming in, but they are both following the blue line. They are only floating point, but there is only one floating point unit here. So both of them will compete on the same floating point unit. And then, they will not get half each because there is some administration and overhead and so on. So it will actually run at less than 100% speed. So two of these sharing the resources would run slower than only one. So for most of the cases when you are running a similar workload like MPI or OpenMP, which is just running the iteration of a loop in parallel, it's beneficial to turn it off. But most processors and, and most systems have the hyper-threading or turned on. But it's very important that you don't schedule too many threads. It is possible to, to see if, in some cases, it's beneficial to launch more threads than you have actual cores like this. So you could maybe schedule a few more threads. It could be beneficial, but that remains to be tested. Again trial and error. There is no magic to tell you. The best practice is to turn it off, to have only one thread for one physical core. But that's the general. There are always cases where you can find the contrary is, is true, but and overall, the best practice is to turn it off. I hope this could explain a little bit about the, the, the hyper-threading and, and, and the, when you can run two threads on a single CPU. So it's a bit complicated. This is easier to run programs in parallel. So this is exploring the space. I mean, here we have two nodes. We have n tasks per node equals four. We have CPU per task equal one. So this is M running MPI, the two nodes, four MPI ranks per per node, and then a single CPU per rank. That means there are no threads, in, in, there is only one thread per MPI rank. But this is a, a five dimensional space. I mean, the, you have the nodes, the task per node, CPUs per task, time, and memory. So exploring this fifth five, dim, five dimensional space by trial and error is time consuming. There's something that can help you a little bit. You can see what's going on here. You can see that that the CPU, um, the CPU time and the average maximum residence memory, the, the RSS is the resident memory. It's the same number that you get in top. You remember that top could give you mem used memory. 
and that's resident memory. It's the important thing because virtual memory is just a number, a number if that to explore how much memory you can use or, or, or virtual use, but it's not real. But the, the, uh, the real memory res resident is the memory that actually you need to have memory chips to fit in. So reviewing the slurm log is important. You can also get uh, knowledge of input output. I, I run a simple test using DD here and just filling a, a a file with zeros, and you could see that it it wrote um, a number of megabytes to the disk, and then Slurm will give you statistics about that. Average disk write, max disk write, and so on. They're about the same because it's only one. It's only do it once. So, and that's um, also something that it's important to to remember that Slurm will give you a lot of information. But then we are back to the input and output. I've said repeatedly that think of a file as a tape spooled up on a spool that you can pull out uh, or, or spool it over to another spool. And if you are reading the file, you start at the beginning and then you read it to the end. That's sequential access. But if you have random access, you have to spool the tape back and forth different and uh, multiple times to find the, your random block to read. And then you have to spool it either backwards and forwards with a C command to get the other block. So random read is notoriously bad. Random write is actually a bit easier because it can be cached. Because if a random write is fire and forget, and you can pile those up hoping that some of those would be able to coalesce to put together so you can dump together several random writes in one read operate one write operation so random write is generally better easier than random read because you don't know where to read next one is going to be read when you do random read but the important thing here is that this is a very large file it's a half a terabyte file 500 gig and i run this on on, uh, on Fox, where we have PCI Express um, local scratch installed. And for some strange reason, the random read is faster than the normal read. I don't really know why, but the, this is the numbers I got. Um, using the, the login one, the, the reason that the, the, the one with the, the one node with the MVNV RAM is slower than the login one is that the login one had pci express version 4 the blades have only pci express version 3 which only have the half the speed so you run into limits with the pci express bus but this is explaining why using the nvme ram or for local scratch can be very very important or is very, very important. You see, even for write and read, it is, it is much faster. But there is also other things to, to take into account that if you are doing different kind of, of file access, if you are writing the, your programs yourself, you can see that you can have cached memory. If you don't do anything, it's generally cached cached uh, disk access, which you see can be quite good, especially for sequential, which is OK. But if you have memory mapped, it's generally not a good idea. But a lot of people prefer memory map files. And this test here show that for writing is not a good idea. And then synchronous and direct. You have to read up a synchronous try to, to to you don't get the control back until the things are actually committed on, on the magnetic layers on the disk, in theory. I mean, in practice, I, I think it's, it, 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 it's something high, high, is happening behind the scenes that we have no control over. So, But you see, it's very slow. So in principle, you should not get the control back until the, the data are committed on, on the magnetic. So this. The, uh, your file access is important for the performance. Then we have the parallel file system. This is um, 
this is an interesting one we can see because it scales with the number of processes up until a certain level where the, the file system cannot handle anymore. So if you can do your IO in parallel, like if you either use MPI IO and, and can manage to, to spread it on, the, on, on different ranks, writing each, each rank can write its own file out to the disk, it could be very efficient. Instead of having only one rank writing, you could see you could get more than twice the performance by using 32 ranks. So parallelism is, is good for, for file system. The disk itself is not very fast, but when you are using, writing to, let's say, 32 different disks, which can happen on a parallel file system because it's made up of hundreds of disks, then you can get quite decent performance. So storage for runs, this is a lot of text. So this one, there is no time to go through everything of these in detail, but you really have to, to print this out and, and remember rem and, and, and look it up when you are running your jobs. But the local scratch, it's generally absolutely fastest way of, of doing scratch, unless you set up a RAM disk or something in memory, which few people does. So you can ask for a local scratch of a certain limit. The here are the, it says local scratch colon 20 gig. That will give you a set aside a local scratch disk of 20 gig. So both Ram and Saga has this option. And I encourage you to, you to use that because if the problems of yesterday where it was sluggish because of people are using the disk, maybe all that work could have been done locally and we would not experience the slowdown that we did yesterday. Those slowdowns that we, down that we saw yesterday are not uncommon. This is because people are using the system. So print this out and, and, and use it for reference, especially the last line. Then prepare a storage plan together with the run script. So where do I keep my files? And um, the files, best practice is to not to use home too much because that's why we have deliberately make the quota a little small. Projects are also uh, restricted under quotas, but the cluster work and there is a slash username. There is no, no quota there, but the files are, are deleted after some time. And of course, you have the local scratch. There are no lim there are no quotas on local scratch, but of course, the disk is limited, and local scratch is deleted when you your job is finished, and you can decide yourself how, how what's the quota is because you you request so and so many gigabytes of, of, of area when you launch the job. I showed this yesterday about scaling, but scaling is um, important today also. Try not to run on, on, on the red or the green one when you see it levels off. Using more CPUs is just wasting resources. So do a review of your program, run it differently, and, and check the scaling. This is It cannot be repeated because people are running running things that could run twice as fast with less cores. Scaling theory. I mean, you don't really want to put yourself in the position of these unlucky ants. Yeah. This is Amdahl's law, which is that it's a, it's the, the gloomy one. You have to read this, this uh, on yourself. But point is that if you are running a short while and you, you, you are walking half the way and then driving half the way, there is no way that you could go any faster than, than the, the time you spent in the walking. No matter how fast the second part is, you still use the time for that you did for walking. So read the text i think it's a, it's a quite a good example but we cannot spend you could spend half a day discussing this so but you have to really understand that about the scaling laws 
but Gustafsson's law is much better because it says that given a big enough problem, then and then the scaling might be the serial part wouldn't really matter that much if the large part of is a large fraction of the of the problem can be run in parallel. The same Emma, is that if you are if you drive the first part, let's say going to the airport, if it takes three hours to get to the airport and one hour flying to Trondheim from Oslo. If the plane goes twice as fast, it doesn't really impact the travel the travel time too much. But if you're going to Mars, it takes more than one year, it wouldn't really matter if it took two or three hours to get to the airport, who cares? So this is the Gustafsson's law. So given a big problem, then it's generally okay because you can have things running in parallel for most of the time. And I run another exercise. And this is also a bit of knowledge here because OpenMP tend to scale less than MPI. This is, of course, OpenMP is generally running shared memory using parallelizing of loops, which is different from MPI because MPI is n number of executables running in parallel with and they are running separately from each other and only communicate with with messages and people who program have very very different paradigms in their head so any most of the time an mpi application will scale much much better than open mp there is an exercise that we'll skip through because we don't have too much time to do it so we'll 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 just jump to that but um, the exercises are there and then the troubleshooting and keep calm and carry on well sometimes you can't carry on but we'll we'll see what we can do when all goes wrong Where do I start? I, I, I have this, this saying that imagine a, a ball of yarn and somebody have taken the, the end of the, the outermost end of, of, of the ball of yarn, then taking the, the, a needle and, and, may, and then pull it through so that the end, both ends are in the middle of the ball. So where do you start? Sometimes I feel like this when, when people come with, with, with problems that there is no way, where do I start? But, well, what do you can do yourself? Is the app, will, does the application start at all? If you do an LDD and find that you have not found, then there are libraries missing. For most of the time, it's missing module. And hopefully, some modules can be loaded that contain these ones and you're you're lucky you can run but sometimes these modules are not present so you have to either make the library yourself or get help or whatever but just presenting this to the to the support staff will be of tremendous value sometimes the support staff and just see those four lines. Okay, this is the Intel compiler. Missing module. Then you can use the find command again that you remember from, from day one that you can ask to try to look for, for, for some of them and you'll find that the cluster software Intel compilers, aha, it's there. And there are different versions of it and you have to think which version do I need? And that can vary because the versions of from the different compilers can be kind of small or minute, but in sometimes very significant differences. Sometimes a program, a large program will run with one of those versions and not with the other. So you can be very unlucky with these versions. MPI, I can, is my program MPI. I can run the, the LDD again. I can see that there is a libmpi program. 
and cluster software MPI and, and then see that there are three MPIs that will probably satisfy this one. And you have to think again, which of the C, C or GNU tool chain was, was my application built with. And you can try to launch the, use the similar or the same MPI library, but MPI is generally quite forgiving with versions. So even though you, you run one MPI library, it might work with some of the others, but don't trust that. Try to build with the same tool chain so that you use GCC 11.3, which is the newest one now. Then there is also this one with the legal instruction. This is a bad one because not all processors are the same. There are Intel processors in, in Saga and Fram, and there are AMD processors in, in, in Betsy. Um, the Intel software is written in such a way that it won't really like to run on something it doesn't know. So if you are building with the Intel compiler, you might see something like this because this is an output from the Intel compiler. Um, it's generally unhappy with flags like um, AWX2, etc. but they are generally very good for vectorization, so with performance wise. And there are some tricks around this and, and ways of dealing with this. So then you have to look up on the, on the documentation about code development. There are ways of cheating fooling the Intel tool chain to think that they are running Intel. There is a function deep inside the Intel compiler that asks, asks for what kind of processor it is. And there is a library call and if you can circumvent that one and, and cheat and have, have something that just report yes, and in respect to the, of, of whatever you ask for. And then your slurm jobs start. There are job submission failed. You see, there is a lot of things it can report. It, it, it tries to report as good as it can. I see the association job limit, resource limit, time limit, job limit, quality of service, and so on. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. Sometimes I wonder it's why it runs at all. Um, invalid account and so on, verify that quality of service. I mean, it could be nodes, tasks, time limits, exceeding the time limits and so on. So Slurm try to admit sensible error messages, read carefully. If you don't understand anything of what's going on, copy the output and, and, and paste it into the support request. The more information from Slurm on, or the messages that you can put into a support request, the better. And not to mention, not uh, not at least, try to remember to state in the support request which host you are on. Am I, is this from Saga, from or Betsy? Because sometimes it's not easy and it's obvious to know where you are running. This one is when, when there are no more quota. But this is also interesting because if you think there is quota, but then again, if you have specified so much wall time that during the run, it will run out of quota, it won't start. And it might also be that you have requested a job that is running and the wall time is set so high that it will think that the quota will be exhausted when this job is done it will not start either. So again, a good reason for not requesting too much wall time. But cost command can be used. But remember that that um, Slurm cannot possibly know when your job is going to stop. It will think that it will stop when the wall time is up. And then that wall time could be much, much longer than anticipated run, than the actual run. So if you are running this one, then you see that if, if you try to run this one at 
at 162 hours and, and it's only 1,000 hours left. And you see that that will give you 13,000 hours, which is clearly more than 1,000, so it wouldn't be able to run. So combination of, 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 of sense, uh, common sense and, and the cost command could, could be quite good. Again, error spelling mistakes and so on is quite common. So review the error messages. Quality of service, too few, too many outside of limits. The only thing I can say here, then, then read the messages carefully and review the documentation. Because some normally it, it is it is a good reason for things that happening. Time limits again, and it's also very various with job type, but it's also something that not everybody think of. If that if there is a scheduled downtown downtime in the future, and let's say that is tomorrow, and you ask for two days, it will not start because the system is not available for more than twenty four hours. So that could also happen. So th there are normally good reasons for everything. Again, the documentation is the, is the key here. So you got submitted, but failed to start. Ask Slurm, priority and note the job ID. Copy it or, or, or whatever and ask Slurm for details. You can run this command and I said, brace yourself for impact. This is why. There is a page full of, of, of things, but you can read from things here and you can see there is the quality of service. There's a lot of information here. Um, but you can look for, for this is when it then, uh, you can see start time, when will it start and so on. And all these information are are available for you, but you just have to do a combination of of reading the manuals or reading the time. Eligible time is the time that the scheduler think it can start. It should start at that time, but you cannot be sure. Things can happen, priority things, and so on. So. It also print out a list of nodes when it expected to be started. But then again, it, if you run this 24 hours later and you still link you, it could change. So, but it's, 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 it's a lot of information and Slurm try to emit as good as it can. Back to this simple list. This one you can print out and, and have available for reference. It fails. Due to time limit, this is easy. I mean, it says what it says, you run out of time. Out of memory killer is, is, is actually a good thing because it prevents you from, from taking down the whole system or at least the one you're running on. So auto memory, then you have to, have to request more memory. If that's not possible, you have to request another system where you have more memory. Of course, not always easy, but there are nodes with more memory. And on from there are two nodes that have six terabytes of memory. That should be enough for most jobs. But of course, somebody might dream up a job with 12 terabyte, which we cannot accommodate in the national systems. This one is, is, is a pretty nasty one because if you fill up your disk quota, Slurm cannot possibly write the log because you and it's not allowed to write anything more. So you, you don't get any log. So if the Slurm log is either empty or, or it's not complete, run the D usage and look if you have filled up your quota because this one is really bad it's a bad one because you don't get anything back from slurm 
and that's a sign that there's probably this code term. So D usage. I think that covers it and we have to do it in time. Yeah, can stop sharing. Yes, thank you, Ole. Thank you so much. Uh, is there any questions that we could uh, take from ACMT uh, collaborative document? Uh, or any question from our Andrew staff? Uh, so, Ole, um, if I have a program running on the on Saga or from one of our systems. Um, how do I find uh, find out this access? Um, what what kind of commands can I use? Ooh, tricky question. <laughs> it, 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 it's not easy to discover your disk access, but you can see there are symptoms of very, very poor disk access. If you're on top, and if you sit and watch it for some time and don't fall asleep, you will sometimes see the status is D, capital D for Delta. Um, that's a disk weight. And this is very, very bad because this is mean that the process want to run, but it's hanging in disk weight. It's waiting for disk. If you start a benchmark that do random read, this process will always be in disk weight because it will waiting for the disk to respond. So that's the simple answer that anyone can do is to look for. If you think that the program is running slow, then top might reveal disk weight and then something is terribly wrong. And as we have seen that random read is better on, on the on the solid state disks or the NVRAM disks, moving there is, an, is, is some kind of remedy, but that was not the question. The question was how to spot it. Of course, there are other ways of, of dealing with this. There are more intrusive ways, but that's for, for, for is in quite advanced stuff. But the, the simple, simple answer is to, to run top and look for, for disk weight status. Oh, thank you. And I see one question about this, the disk quota. Could the slurm output file be exempt from the disk quota? Ah, yeah, that would be a nice one. <laughs> yeah, but you know, <laughs> the slurm file is also containing output from your program. So I can easily see that some clever guys and clever girls will 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 circumvent the disk quota by piping everything into the slurm file. <laughs> so yeah, but that would be quite nice that the 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 errors could be exempt from the disk quota. Yeah, that's I don't think it's easy, but it it's a very good idea. But you could also redirect your errors to a place where your disk quota is not counted against, like cluster work. Yeah, you could. You mm -hmm. could do that. You could so you could re re redirect the, the slurm out to that to that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I haven't checked the um, slurm emit. There are two files: an output file and an error file. Yeah, you could redirect the error file to to to, to another place. Yeah, true. You see any other questions uh, here? Is there anything we have to take uh, from uh, Hedgehog? Uh, sorry. Yeah, I see. Um, yeah, most of them answers. How okay. how long we have? Because I can ask a question from Ule. Something he will get really excited. I don't know how how long he will talk if I ask this. No, I, I'll yeah. I'll be I'll be brief, <laughs> but that it, it might be talk, it might be theme for another training. But yeah, yeah. So 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 let's so we 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 have some um, um, users, um, especially in the local systems, that we find out um, that the the disk is not properly used. 
uh, disk access. They don't think about disk access. They access um, instead of um, local scratch, they access other parts. So when when these kind of things happens and the system slow down, um, how do we um, sort of um, um, make sure that it doesn't affect the the other users? So if I make it simply, uh, as a user, if I'm running something and if I'm uh, if um, to make sure that my processes do not affect others, how do you use this uh, responsibly? Uh, and yeah. what kind of uh, tools that be uh, the the let's say the um, the staff if they find out something that if uh, if if it is slow, then if when the staff ask tell you that um, your your process is slowing down others, what what kind what kind of response should should the, the as a user I should be. Um, so I'm asking more like a rhetorical question: How to use this responsibly? Uh, shared resource. How do I use this responsibly? No, not just my process. Yeah, I know. But like yesterday, Saga was very slow. I mean, LS took time loading a module took even longer, took forever. And I don't think anyone is deliberately misusing the system. And some jobs actually require disk access of this kind but what you can think of can i isolate isolate my problem to a local node or local nodes by using the local file system if i can if i can do it that will lessen the burden for everybody else for the parallel file system if not then this is how the world is, is la vie, as it, in French, this is, this is just a fact of life. I mean, if it's nothing you can do, you need to run it in this way, then this is the way things are. So the, the computer is overloaded, yes, but there's nothing we can do. I mean, we cannot ban the users from, from running. We just have to live with it and train the user not to get too annoyed when things are slow. But if you can isolate it to the local nodes using the local local scratch, it's coming a long way. But that won't take you to the finish line. It will just take you some some part of the way because there are times when there is no way around using the parallel file system for running because you may be in the, yeah yeah. There's a lot so, of reasons. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a very prudent answer. Like if you can't control it, at least isolate it. So the effect will not affect um, others. Yeah. If you can isolate it, do it. If not, then tough luck. Thank you. Is there any more question? That, um... Please ask your question on this collaborative document. We would like to have more questions since Sule is here, so he can answer most of this uh, specific question. 